Hey guys, welcome to Solo React Talk. Today I'm going to be reacting to the end of Polish democracy. Pel Sodiski, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, and the San Sanjak re regime. Yes, between two wars, 1935, part two or four by time goes to history. Sorry guys if I'm butchering the words here. Um, 1935. 36, 37, 38, 39. Four more years to go. Four more years. And then World War II begins. With the invasion of uh, Poland. Yes. Wow. Just four years. Okay. Hmm. Let's start. Three, two, one, go. Adolf Hitler will call it a so called state, lacking every national historical cultural and moral foundation. Molotov will call it the monstrous bastard of the peace of Versailles. Keynes will call it an economic impossibility whose only industry is Jew baiting. Others will call it a farce or, or pathological or a historical failure. The country these people are all talking about is Poland. By 1935, it has slid into an authoritarian regime that is looked down upon by almost all of the great powers. It is being squeezed from both sides by powerful aggressors. But how did it get to this point? And will it be able to save itself? Man, people really did not like Poland. <laughs> they really did not like Poland. Welcome to Between Two Wars, a chronological summary of the interwar years, covering all facets of life, the, the uncertainty, hedonism, and euphoria, and ultimately, humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. I'm Indy Nidell. If you've been with us since 1921, you'll know that Józef Pilsudski worked to establish the cunningly named Second Polish Republic amid ethnic tension, revolution, and war. Despite failing to achieve his ultimate goal of a modern-day Polish-Lithuanian commonwealth, as head of state, he has crafted a republic that has gained international recognition and beaten back numerous enemies. Most impressively, he is responsible for the miracle at the Vistula against the Soviet army. And this is already rapidly gaining mythical status among the Polish population. But the shine of new independence is quickly rubbing off as Poland finds itself burdened with some pretty severe problems. For starters, about one third of this Polish nation states are not ethnic Poles. 14% are Ukrainians, 4% Belarusians, 2% German, 10% Jewish, and 1% a patchwork of other ethnicities like Russian, Czech, Lithuanian. Even among the Poles themselves, things are pretty divided. See. For over a hundred years, the Polish lands have been partitioned by three separate powers, meaning three different administrative systems, legal codes, and conventions. This is compounded by economic imbalance. Commentators even talk of a Poland A, referring to the more well-developed western half of the country, and Poland B, the eastern, less developed half. The political scene of the Republic is dominated by the National Democracy, known as Endesia, the Polish Socialist Party, PPS, and a group of populist parties representing the peasantry. The Endesia, led by Roman Dmowski, are the most powerful party in the early 1920s, and they're committed to conservative values, patriotism, Catholicism, and a deep-seated intolerance towards both Jews and Germans. Dmowski himself has always been somewhat of a nemesis to Pilsudski, whose ambitions of a federalized, multi-ethnic commonwealth fly in the face of the Andesia's Poland for the Poles. Pilsudski and such a thing as Poland for the Poles is just not going to work. But hey, you know, people will do what they do for their dreams to come true, no matter what. He himself has in the past been associated with the PPS, but leaves after independence to emphasize his role as a non-partisan head of state committed to the nation. The PPS itself is somewhat of a broad array of groups, incorporating not only socialists, but also patriotic military men, liberal intellectuals, ethnic minorities, and, and anti-clericals. The peasant movement is made up of three main parties, and as you may have guessed from the name, draws support from the peasantry. 
Some have a more left-wing bent and others a more right-wing one. So the political life of the Republic is split across several axes, and Pilsudski soon becomes disillusioned with it all. He worked hard to forge this new nation-state, but is now snubbed by the same, the lower house of parliament, when they passed the March Constitution in 1921. This is thanks to Domovsky and the Andesia, who ensure that presidential powers are limited to pretty much ceremonial duties. Pilsudski declines to run for such a neutered office. So if the presidency is, you know, having its powers curtailed, who has executive decisions on matters that require, uh, you know, the ministries and uh, the head of state to make an ultimate decision on something? Is there going to be another office, like a, a prime minister office? You know, you'll have your president and then you'll have your prime minister that is, you know, the, the leader of government. Hmm. And in December 1922, Poland votes to replace him with the socialist-supported Gabriel Narutovich, a close associate of Pilsudski's. But the Endesia, who themselves had emerged victorious in parliamentary elections the previous months, roar their disapproval. They denounce Narutovich as the Jewish president and protest his presidency viciously. In just a matter of days, rhetoric becomes reality as Narutovich is shot dead in Warsaw by a painter belonging to the Endesia movement. A painter? Hey, okay. Disgusted at how quickly democracy has fallen into chaos, Pilsudski retreats from political life. In the next few years will only increase his disillusion. The economy almost has to be built from scratch. Unrest is frequent in both rural and urban areas as peasants and workers alike face tough times. Pre-war trading patterns have collapsed and hyperinflation is running amok. Dealing with these problems would be formidable for any government, but the Polish people find themselves particularly disappointed with theirs. Proceedings in the same often descended into tumultuous argument, abuse, even physical violence. Accusations of corruption run rampant on all sides, and successive governments fall without passing any significant legislation. Yeah. It's time for a dictatorship. This is not to say the story of Poland's first years is one of failure. Considering the enormous difficulties the nation inherited, Poland has made admirable progress. In 1924, a single currency, the złoty, is introduced to replace the six that had previously been in circulation. A central bank is also established, and politicians work to raise foreign loans. This, along with increased taxes on the wealthy, gets Poland some badly needed cash for public investment, and some form of economic infrastructure is starting to emerge. But Poland's fortunes do still look grim, and she has found herself in threatening diplomatic waters. We are I mean, she has, so yeah, Poland has enemies to the east and enemies to the west, and I'm not sure about the south. But definitely Russia, Germany, right next door, they are not liking the fact that this country is right smack down in the middle of both of them. Uh, and I, I think, you know, with Germany, they don't even recognize the country because, you know, what if, uh, what Indy Nidal has been saying that, you know, this uh, country uh, it, it does not exist. It doesn't it doesn't have history. You know, that's what Adolf Hitler was saying, you know, and yeah, so. Really, it has enemies. It has enemies and the enemies are gunning uh, for its territory and wanting to, you know, devour it. So yeah, it's got problems. Internally, externally, it has problems. Already know that Poland's eastern neighbor, Soviet Russia, has a pretty keen interest in seeing her destroyed or, well, part of Soviet Russia, but her western neighbor is just as dangerous, if not more so. To be honest, the Versailles... And it wasn't just Germany that invaded Poland. It, it was also Russia. They came in from the eastern side, while the, uh, while the Germans came in from the western side. Uh, and they both, you know, utterly destroyed Poland and, you know, uh, uh, assumed them into their territory, if I can say that. Yeah. The settlement kind of made this inevitable. The conflict 
over Upper Silesia and the Polish corridor, cutting Eastern Prussia off from the rest of Germany, means that every German government in this period is committed to revising its post-war borders. On top of this, the League of Nations mandated free city of Danzig causes continual tension. Its German-dominated Senate is deeply hostile to the Polish state and fiercely committed to keeping the city tied to the German Reich. This is matched by the German population's hostility to the Polish minority in the city. Danzig also symbolizes German grievances against Poland and the Versailles decisions in general, not just to Germany, but to many in the West. Now, Poland and France do sign an alliance in 1921, providing the former with some form of assured security. But this means little without similar assurances from Britain, who aren't really that interested in Eastern Europe. And imagine how the Poles feel in 1922 when their two greatest enemies, Russia and Germany, sign a treaty at Rapallo agreeing to cooperate in a spirit of mutual goodwill. And then in 1925, when Germany first enters a trade war with Poland and then also refuses to recognize the legitimacy of its eastern borders during the Locarno negotiations. I like what these politicians write in their documents or declarations of cooperation <laughs> really <laughs> it's funny it's really funny and then in april 1926 when what is by now the soviet union and germany reaffirm good relations with each other with the treaty of berlin well from his retirement pilsudski has witnessed all this national insecurity political strife and economic turbulence always considering himself as a man of destiny he decides he must act and a significant number of his supporters agree. By May 1926, the Polish Republic has seen 14 short-lived governments. The election of the latest one, headed by Vincenti Vitos of the peasant movement, sparks protests immediately. On May the 11th, demonstrators gather in Warsaw shouting, long live Pilsudski, down with Vitos. Pilsudski sees his chance. The following day, he marches with 2,000 men to the center of Warsaw. His intention is a non-violent show of force. Not happening. To prove that only he is capable of saving the nation. But as a general rule, governments don't really tend to appreciate rebellious military officers marching towards them, even if they do so non-violently. So they fight back and three days of violence unfolds. A coup has somehow taken place. Some also call it a civil war. And by the end, close to 400 are dead and 1,000 wounded. In the early hours of May 15th, the government calls for a ceasefire and swiftly resigns. Pilsudski becomes Minister of Military Affairs, but refuses the positions of either Prime Minister or President, preferring instead to fill them with allies. But what is Pilsudski working towards and, and how is he going to do it? It's actually pretty tricky to tell. It is rare for him to make clear policy announcements or ideological statements. Despite seizing power from an elected government through military force, Pilsudski is no Mussolini, and he considers himself a Democrat at heart. A suitable phrase to describe his approach might be guided democracy. Now, now depending on how cynical or idealistic you are, you might either see this as nothing but a facade for autocracy or an honest effort to ensure stability in a struggling country. I will I will take the latter half, you know, because of the chaotic political uh, situation in Poland. You know, 14 governments, 14 in successive, you know, just changing over and over and over again. No, there's something has to be done about that, considering that they have enemies uh, on the left and on the right that are signing cooperation deals, uh, having goodwill, you know, uh, uh, ties and, and communications with, with each other. And you know for a fact that they don't like the fact that Poland exists. So the potential for war is very clear and evident. And, you know, the political situation inside the country is also tough. I, I'm, I'm just, you know... I'm just worried about what will this entail because you know governments that are led by dictators because that's what he's going to be that's what he is right now he's going to he is a dictator uh how they uh suppress 
people, how they suppress the media, how they uh, incarcerate them, some of them killed, you know, in camps. Uh, and it just becomes terrible. It becomes a horrible situation. Um, so yeah, it, it it's a difficult situation. I don't. I just don't see how is it going to be resolved. Really, that's why I'm saying that you know the way th things were going there. It seems like another dictation. Uh, I mean, a, dicta a dictatorship is going to take over the government. You know, it's just the way it was going towards. I don't see any other avenue. <sighs> yeah. Let both sides battle it out in the comments. Should be interesting. Okay, vagaries aside, there is no question that Pilsudski is fiercely committed to the task of sanatia. This means the moral healing of the nation where corruption is eliminated, productive citizenship is revered, and the Polish state is elevated above all else. This mainly takes the form of rooting out corruption and securing the cooperation of the army and the landed classes. Constitutional amendments are also passed to strengthen the executive and weaken the same. Government roles are filled with close allies, mainly military men imbued with a strong sense of order, virtue, and purpose. Pilsudski wants to reshape the entire political system, but he wishes to do so in at least a semi-democratic way. Now, this wish does little to calm the fears of Pilsudski's growing left-wing opposition, who grouped together in 1929 to form the Centrolev Alliance. They assemble in June 1930 to draft their manifesto. It declares that Poland has come under the personal dictatorship of Pilsudski, with elected governments only masking this. They proclaim their ultimate goal to be the removal of Pilsudski from power and the reintroduction of genuine parliamentary democracy. And now that this has happened, like any other dictator, they will suppress uh, any form of dissension, any form of sedition against the state. And any attempt at state terrorism will be met with physical force. The reaction comes some months later, but it comes harshly. In September, the leaders are rounded up and confined to a military prison until after new elections have taken place. In October, military officers armed with revolvers and drawn swords attend the opening of the session of same. The conservative opposition have fared no better in all of this. They too have faced undemocratic maneuvering and their primary vehicle for resistance is sliding into disarray. Domovsky established the camp of Great Poland and it does boast relatively good membership numbers, but its effectiveness is limited and it is increasingly drifting into hysterical xenophobia and racism. The fact that left-wing and right-wing opposition hate each other just as much as they do the Sanasia regime means Pilsudski can steer a clear path between them both. And so, with the next elections in November 1930, the BBWR shoot to victory with 56% of the vote. This is the non-party bloc for cooperation with the government, set up by Pilsudski's allies in 1927. They now take none of the chances that they took back then when they got just a quarter of the vote, arresting more opposition leaders and canceling candidacies. The following years see the Sanasia regime taking on an even more authoritarian character. In 1932, over 50 professors are dismissed from university positions for their opposition sympathies. In 1933, the camp of Great Poland is banned and the leaders of the Central Lev Alliance face sentences of either imprisonment or exile. Things ramp up even more in 1934. When you were exiled, where are you exiled to exactly? Where are they going to, you know, deport you to? Where? Where exactly? For when a detention camp for political dissidents is established in Bereza Kartushka. Conditions are exceptionally harsh there and torture is common. The death count, though, is officially pretty low. But this is more to do with the authorities' tactic of releasing prisoners who are at death's door. While Pilsudski... Ah, okay, loopholes. His domestic policy is becoming more and more openly authoritarian. He is balancing his foreign one a bit more delicately. He is only too aware of France's shaky military commitments and knows that the slightest provocation will enrage Poland's mortal enemies in both the West and the East. 
he opts for the so-called doctrine of two enemies. The idea is that any indication that Poland is moving closer to one state at the expense of the other would spark tension and, and maybe war. The only option is the strictest policy of neutrality with both countries so that neither feels threatened. This is a balancing act that, you know, has the potential of just collapsing in on itself and it will just create a huge, uh, you know, diplomatic situation for Poland. So, yeah, they really have to be as neutral and as uh, impartial as possible. Yeah. Is it going to succeed? Well, in four years time, <laughs> after 1935, it didn't work out so well. So, yeah. This policy forms not only the basis of relations with the USSR and Germany, but also the West. Pilsudski and his foreign minister since 1932, Colonel Josef Beck, refused to be part of any multilateral agreements which might strain relations with either of the two enemies. With this doctrine in mind, Pilsudski and Beck worked to forge the Polish-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact in 1932, valid for three years. Both sides renounce war as a means of settling international disputes and agree not to aid any other state, Germany is explicitly mentioned, if it is at war with either one of them, directly or indirectly. France is actually pretty happy with this agreement. She has been pursuing a policy of rapprochement with the Soviets. So the fact that her ally is as well, yeah, well, that's something, yeah, they're pretty happy about that. The agreement is even renewed in 1934 for another 10 years. Easy stuff, right? Okay, well, things aren't quite as simple with Germany. Beck manages to sign the Polish-German Declaration of Non-Aggression, valid for 10 years, in 1934, but not without difficulty. For one, the Nazi foreign ministry has insisted on declaration over pact because it somehow implies a recognition of the Polish-German border. However, they do renounce wars of aggression and agree to settle disputes via negotiations. It also has led to an icing of the Danzig issue. Nazi officials have instructed party members to stop their attacks on Polish buildings in the city. But both sides know that the declaration only provides them with breathing space. France is also pretty angry about this. The whole point of their alliance with Poland is to restrain Germany in the east. But with the two sides officially declaring that they have no appetite for war, well, that's pretty useless. The fear among the Allies now is that Germany can focus more on rearmament and breathing down Austria's neck to incorporate it into the Reich. But for Poland, the Allies had already left her behind at Locarno. The agreement with Germany only redresses the balance again to them. So on the international stage, the Sanasio regime has appeared to gain a modicum of security. And on the home front, there is more stability despite the increases in repression and brutality. But then, in May 1935, Josef Pilsudski dies of cancer. A new constitution had been passed only a month before that had been tailor-made for him. The April constitution declared that the president, i.e. Pilsudski, to be responsible only before God and the state and significantly reduced the power of the same. Pilsudski's death leaves not only a power vacuum, but also a moral one. He had been the unifying force and the justification for Sanasia. Without him, Poland is just another country under an authoritarian regime. Still, unlike its neighbors to the east and west, Poland has escaped the worst excesses of totalitarianism. There are no industrial concentration camps or gulags, no acts of institutional discrimination, no mass killings. But it is now undeniably under an authoritarian regime and not even a particularly unified or efficient one at that. The doctrine of two enemies only seems to be prolonging the inevitable and Poland's international situation seems to be worsening each and every day. If you have not yet watched our episode on how Poland gained its independence in the first place, you can click for that right here, any minute now. Our Time Ghost Army member for this episode is Tyler Weepy. It is because of our Time Ghost Army members that we can make 
quality historical content like this. So please join us at patreon.com or timegoes.tv and become a member of the greatest history community in the world. So, when Homer came up with being caught between Scylla and Charybdis, he expected you would have to choose between being torn apart by a six-headed monster or, or swallowed by the other. He probably did not expect you to be eaten by both. Nastrovia. Oh, that's not Polish. Okay, guys, that's it with the end of the Polish democracy. Polut, uh, Pils, Pilsudski. <laughs> oh my gosh. Pilsudski and the Sanasia regime between two wars, 1935, part two of four by Time Ghost History. Oh, guys, I'm sorry for butchering these words. I am so sorry. Um, yeah, Poland really was in a tough situation um, it had enemies to the west enemies to the east its only ally you know militarily france was not really you know forthcoming in being a strong ally to poland you know uh, mainly france wanted to use poland as a as a magnet to you know attract germany to it instead of Germany targeting Austria and all the other nations uh, that, you know, it would it would have wanted to, you know, assume into its territory. So, yeah, Poland was being used by France. Uh, Britain was not really interested in the politics of Eastern Europe, you know. So what, what other options did Poland have at the time? And, you know, uh, Pul Puduski, he had no choice, I would say, you know, he had to act on this situation because, you know, politics in the country was topsy-turvy. It just couldn't stabilize itself. Uh, they had internal situations and to compound it even more, they had external situations. And literally the country that is Poland was going to face a very dire situation, you know, and he took a decision um, he took over the government he became the dictator of the government um, Indian Idel said that the, uh, this you know autocratic government didn't really have the hallmarks of any kind of dictatorship you know where people are being tortured uh, murdered you know in excessive numbers I'm not saying it didn't happen but it didn't happen in excessive numbers there were no concentration camps of the sorts you know uh, but yes, repression uh, and, and suppression of, of, of people and their ideas and their freedom of speech was uh, prevalent in Poland. Um, but like I said, like w what what was going to be the solution in this kind of situation? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Um, but yeah, it was tough. It was tough. 1935. Four more years, then it's 1939, and you know all that uh, Podolsky tried to bring into fruition was left in tatters. You know all those agreements, those non-aggression pacts uh, with Russia or with Germany just were set aside, and you know the two nations worked together. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say they worked together. You know, but they did have an agreement to say we will attack from the east while you guys attack from the west, and that's what happened. And yeah, World War Two. Huh, guys, that's it for tonight uh, with Time Ghost History. Remember, if you want to check out the original video as well as Time Ghost History's YouTube channel, the links are in the description below. If you like my reaction, please give me a like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Click on the notification bell if you want to be up to date with my latest videos. And I'll see you guys next time. Again, I am sorry for butchering the names. I am truly sorry. I <laughs> I need to practice. <laughs> okay, guys. Good night.